Back in 1998, Microsoft was printing money. Windows ran on almost every desktop, and Bill Gates was the richest man alive. But on Halloween, a confidential memo leaked called the Halloween Documents. It was written by Microsoft's own engineers, and these memos revealed something kind of extraordinary, that Microsoft was terrified, not worried, but actually genuinely terrified. You see, the documents acknowledged that Linux and open source software was technologically competitive with Microsoft's own products. But more importantly, it outlined Microsoft's strategy to combat this threat. And it was all a little bit kind of Dr. Evil, a strategy based on sowing the seeds of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Their goal was honestly kind of simple. It was spread rumors, extend open protocols to make them incompatible, decommoditize everything that Linux used. One memo literally suggested using legal battles to slow Linux's development. This wasn't a confidence play, it was a panic. But why were they panicking? Well, it's because Linux had discovered something that Microsoft really couldn't compete against, the ability to mobilize a whole movement of thousands of developers across the internet. One Microsoft memo praised, quote, the ability of the open source process to collect and harness the collective IQ of thousands of individuals across the internet. And it was a, quote, direct short-term revenue and platform threat to Microsoft. Put simply, Microsoft's own people were in awe of what they were up against. So Microsoft threw the kitchen sink at it. They called Linux a cancer. They funded studies claiming Windows had lower total cost of ownership, even though their own internal documents showed Linux was cheaper. They implemented proprietary protocols to lock customers in. They fought with everything they had. And here's what happened. They lost, and they lost spectacularly. So let me show you the three battlegrounds where Linux really achieved dominance so complete, it borders on the bonkers. Battleground number one, supercomputers. Since 2017, Linux runs on 100% of the world's top 500 fastest supercomputers. Not 99%, not 98%, every single one. Battleground two, servers. Linux controls somewhere in the ballpark of 62% of the global server market. But that's the boring stat. Here's the interesting one. Among the top 1 million websites in the world, Linux powers 45.4% of them. For the top 10,000 websites, 49%. For the top 1,000, 49.4%. Notice the pattern? The bigger and more demanding your infrastructure, the more likely you are to run Linux. Why? Because at scale, the total cost of ownership argument Microsoft pushed collapses completely. When you're running thousands of servers, Linux's freedom from licensing fees saves you millions. Plus, you can optimize it exactly how you need it. And Battleground 3, and this is the one that really stinks to Microsoft, is mobile devices. Android, which runs on the Linux kernel, powers 72% of all smartphones globally. If you count all devices, and not just desktops, Linux-based Android is the single most popular operating system on Earth, with 44.5% global market share. Windows, 27%. Linux won the platform war. They won by going when Microsoft wasn't looking. Oh, and before I continue, if you're finding this breakdown interesting, I'd love it if you could whack that like button and maybe even hit that subscribe button. It really helps small channels like mine grow. Now, here's where it gets particularly interesting. How did a free operating system built by volunteers defeat a multi-billion dollar corporation with armies of engineers and unlimited marketing budgets? Well, here's the secret. Linux didn't just compete with Microsoft. It made Microsoft kind of irrelevant. Just think about it. Microsoft's entire business model back then was based on control control the operating system, control the protocols, control the ecosystems, lock customers in. Their moat was proprietary technology. And then Linux came along and said, what if we just give everything away? What? No, no, all right. I know that sounds bad. What if we make it free, open, and modifiable? What if we let anyone contribute? What if we let anyone come into the tent? Microsoft thought this was fucking insane. How do you compete with free? How do you fight something that gets better every time someone uses and contributes to it? The answer is you don't, you can't. It's like trying to fight the tide. And here's the beautiful bit. The more people who use Linux, the better it got. Every developer who contributed code made it stronger. Every bug fix improved it. Every optimization helped everyone. Microsoft model thrived on scarcity, but Linux's model thrived on abundance. It's kind of difficult to really understate how powerful this was. Just in Ubuntu, where I ran the community team, our community alone translated Ubuntu completely into 120 languages. We had over 300 local user groups around the world. We had thousands of people contributing every second of every day to Ubuntu. And this was just one open source project. 
There was Linux, there was Apache, there was Blender, there was WordPress, and thousands of other projects happening all around the world. You see, this is what really made Linux and open source invincible. You don't just build a product and then find users. You build a community that builds the product with you. You see, Linux didn't really have customers. It had users and contributors. Every user could become a developer. Every developer had a stake in its success. Linux stopped just being a boring operating system kernel. It became an ethos, an ideology, and a movement where we all wanted to be a part of it. And building a movement really works. Just look at what happened next to Microsoft. By 2018, they completely reversed course. They bought GitHub for $7.5 billion. They made .NET open source. They introduced Windows subsystem for Linux. They started contributing to the Linux kernel itself. Microsoft, the company that once called Linux a cancer, became one of its biggest supporters. Why? Because they finally understood. You can't beat a movement. You can only join it. And this is exactly the kind of work that we do at my company, StateShift. We help companies build movements just like this. We work side by side with tech companies to design and install the systems that turn user and developer interest into really pragmatic engagement, adoption, and growth. You can find out more about StateShift by clicking on the link down there. But here's what most people miss in this story. Earlier, I talked about the desktop market, but it doesn't matter anymore. Linux already won. They won servers, they won supercomputers, they won mobile, they won the cloud, they won IoT devices, they won embedded systems. Microsoft won the desktop, and the desktop became the least important computing platform in the world. That's not a consolation prize, that's strategic annihilation. So what can you learn from all of this? Well, three principles. First, don't compete on the same terms as the incumbent. Linux didn't try to out Microsoft Microsoft. They changed the game entirely by making software free and open. Secondly, build a movement, not just a customer base. Microsoft had customers. Linux had believers. Believers don't just buy, they build, they recruit, they defend. They want to move the movement forward. Thirdly, infinite games beat finite games. Microsoft played to win market share. Linux played to change how software was made. When you play in a different game, you really can't lose. So the next time you hear about a scrappy underdog taking on an entrenched giant, look for those patterns. Are they building a community or just acquiring customers? Are they changing the rules or playing by the incumbent's playbook? Are they fighting for market share or fighting for something bigger? Because Linux proved something really kind of profound. You don't need the most money. You don't need the most resources. You need a movement. And movements once started are nearly impossible to stop. All right, so thank you for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button. And if you found this video interesting, you should absolutely check out this video next because a lot of developer tools companies are missing one really crucial ingredient that's needed to get hundreds of thousands of developers excited about what they're building. And in that video, I walk through what that ingredient is and how you can integrate it. So check it out. I'll see you there.